You remember that song, uh, When the Deer? Isn't that a beautiful song? Good to sing that uh, once in a while. With that said, we won't be singing it today. Sorry, I, but I will. I will add that one in at some point. Thank you, Donna, for that. Turn your hymnals, if you would, please. Let's sing number 522. Let's celebrate our Savior. Celebrate what the Lord has done. Celebrate what, what real love uh, from God has accomplished in this world for those of us who have turned to Christ for salvation. 522. Let's sing the first and the third and fourth stanza. Father, thank you that uh, you have sent the Savior. Thank you that you have provided for our salvation. You provided for us to be able to stand before you as righteous people because the Savior took on our sinfulness. Uh, thank you so much for that. And today, Lord, as we continue through our service, we pray that you would be honored and glorified by the things we sing, by the things we do. And I pray that you'd work in each of our hearts. Uh, draw us closer to you. Thank you, Father. I'm praying this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Let's uh, go through a couple announcements, if you would. Uh, first of all, though, I, I want to read this card. This comes from Margaret. Uh, this is on the heels of her sister having passed away and some of the other family issues that had occurred. She says, bless you for the little things you do in thoughtful ways. Bless you for the way you've brightened up so many days. Bless you for your giving heart, as kind as it can be. Bless you in a thousand ways for truly blessing me. And then she says, Dear Pastor and our church family, thank you. With deep appreciation and gratitude, I wish to thank you all for your prayers and love bestowed upon me and my sister's family. It meant very much to me as I uh, felt God's love surrounding me through your prayers uh, during a time difficult for me. Praying for God's great love and blessing upon each of you. Love, Margaret Diamond. And uh, we were glad to be able to minister that way, as we know you would pray for so many of us in the same situation. So do continue to pray for her. There is another thing, though, that we would like you to pray for. Some of you have seen our email uh, listing the prayer request for Lee Montgomery. You know, Lee and Kim usually sit back here in this corner. Uh, well, Lee found out this week that her cancer has come back. And uh, in the letter, we mentioned five tumors in her brain. There's actually only three, but they're still pretty serious. And uh, from what I was told by Kim, the doctors think that those three are all treatable. However, her cancer has metastasized, and it's moving through other parts of her body, and right now they have found some in her lung. So I uh, do be praying for her. Um, they kept hoping she'd come home in the last couple of days, but she's still there. Kim's hoping that they can bring her home today. Uh, she's in uh, Munson in Traverse City. 
But uh, pray for Kim, Kim Schmidt, as she cares for her mom. Uh, it's a lot to do. She's also got her own career that, that keeps her very busy. Uh, so pray for her and pray for the rest of the family. I know that they would appreciate that. Also, one of the things that they appreciated is there were some cards sent to them and I ministered to them. If you would like to send a card to Kim or to Lee or to both of them, their addresses are in the back on the table there. We have a, a church directory. I think Lynn's got it open to Lee's address. But uh, if, you, if you would feel led to do that, I know that it would minister to them. So thank you uh, very much. It is a, a difficult time for them at this point. Ladies, I want to remind you that the next ladies book study is this coming Saturday, May 1st. Can you believe that Saturday is May 1st? Uh, we're, we're getting there. Uh, but uh, ladies, that'll be here at church at uh, 10 a.m. And uh, Lynn does have extra sets of questions and so forth on the back as you're doing chapter 8 in that particular book. Um, other than that, we just have our regular announcements. So remember, we have prayer meeting here at church at 6 o'clock on Wednesday night. And, of course, there's Sunday school on Sunday mornings at 945. Paul is working through the biblical foundations for living, and it's been very good. It's been very helpful. So we would invite you to come and be a part of that with us. All right, I believe that's all the announcements. I just remind you that there are baskets in the back corner if you would like to leave your offering with that, or if you want to mail it in. The church's uh, mailing address is P.O. Box 631. 631, I got it right. 631, a grayling. I, I never mail anything to myself there. So, But, uh, but no, if you, uh, however, uh, you would like to take care of that. But thank you for your faithfulness and giving toward this ministry. Okay, I believe we will move on in song. I'd like us to sing this song, Before the Throne of God Above. <laughs> Jesus is your advocate if you know him as your Savior. And he's standing before the throne of God, and you are covered. He's your defense attorney, if you want to say it that way. And no one can look at you and say, you don't belong here, leave. You're there. The Lord Jesus has provided for your salvation. So, amen. Hallelujah. Turn your Bibles, if you would, please, to the book of Genesis. We're going to be in Genesis. Well, let's see. Actually, make that the book of Romans. <laughs> we will get to Genesis in a couple minutes. But the book of Romans, chapter 5. And I'd like to begin in, in verse 12 of Romans, chapter 5. 
Paul just got through talking about the fact that the Lord Jesus died in our, in, in our place, much like that song we just talked about. And then he says this in chapter, or verse 12 of chapter 5. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sin. He's talking about Adam, of course. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which come from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we will continue on. Father, again we thank you for sending the Savior for us to provide a, uh, a sacrifice for our sins. And so that we can stand before you as righteous as the Lord Jesus has provided for us. And, uh, and know that uh, the, the death penalty that you pronounced upon Adam and Eve when they sinned, the Lord Jesus took that penalty for us. Thank you, Father. And I pray that you'd help us now to live our lives in a way that would bring glory to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to our Heavenly Father. Uh, may we live in a way that, that uh, points others toward you and brings honor to your name. I'm praying this in Jesus' name. Let's sing one more song together. This is In Christ Alone.
aren't you glad that you don't have to stand before God's throne based on whether you were good enough? Based on whether you did enough to do things? You know, sometimes if, uh, if someone's ever confronted about a particular sin in their life, they'll sometimes say, you're not my judge, only God can judge me. Shouldn't that scare them to death? I mean, they don't realize what they're saying. But we don't have to stand before God's throne hoping that we did enough hoping that we were good enough. No, we stand before God's throne knowing that our Savior was righteousness enough, and he's the one that provided for us. So, amen and hallelujah. Now, if you would, please, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Genesis. We will be in there. Genesis chapter 6. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 3 and 4 is where we're going to begin. We've been talking about uh, dispensationalism as a way of looking at the scriptures. And, you know, I know that a lot of times we, we don't want to feel like we're just going through a theology book because, of course, the scriptures are what's most important. However, this is one of those things that I want us to take a few weeks to look through because it affects the way that we read the scriptures. It affects the way that we look at the scriptures. And uh, that's why we want to look at this. If you'll remember, a dispensation, as, as we will look at it, is a time frame where God placed certain responsibilities upon his people. And uh, then they either obeyed or they disobeyed, and then God dealt with it, either with judgment or blessing, that sort of a thing. And uh, we will notice by reading through the scriptures that God did deal with different people at different times in different ways. Now, not for salvation. Salvation has always been by faith through the grace of God. That it's, it's always been that way. So we're not talking about salvation. We're just talking about with the way God was dealing with people at that particular time. And last week we looked at the idea, some would call it the dispensation of innocence, and that was Adam and Eve before they sinned in the garden. And God dealt with them in a certain way. And if you'll notice, he's never dealt with any of us the way that he dealt with them as far as with these specifics. Uh, for instance, uh, we don't walk in the garden with God as Adam and Eve did, okay? And another thing is, is God has not commanded you not to eat of a fruit of a certain tree. Now, we need to understand that. That, that might seem kind of simple, but there are some people who could look at the scriptures and say, he told Adam and Eve not to do this. Well, what tree is it? We need to think about that. And they might go to the extent of identifying a certain tree, like let's say they suppose it was an apple tree. And, and it was an apple tree we're not supposed to eat of. Therefore, we as believers, we should not eat apples. Because God told them not to do that. Now, that would be kind of silly, wouldn't it? I don't know of anyone that actually does that, by the way. But that's just a, an example of the type of thing. No, God hasn't placed that particular uh, stewardship upon us. But he did on Adam and Eve. And then once Adam and Eve sinned, as we looked at last week, he dealt with them, and he, he meted out uh, some of the uh, retribution, if you will, that comes by disobeying God and walking away from, from his commands, and that's going to take us into the next thing now. We're going to look at the next dispensation, and um, let me remind you that the exact number of dispensations doesn't really matter. Uh, different people will come up with different numbers. Generally speaking, when you read, if you were to read a theologian that is talking about it, generally speaking, they come up with a number seven. They, they can find seven distinct times, but some come with more, some come with less. It all depends on where you want to draw the line and how you want to do that. Okay, I, I understand that. But we're going to just go with the, the, the general idea here, and, and we're going to look at seven of them, actually. Uh, last week, again, was the dispensation of innocence. Now we're going to look at the dispensation of fallen man. And some might call it the dispensation of conscience. I, I like the phrase, of fallen man, better myself. But after Adam and Eve fell, now life is different. Life has been changed. Remember, God sent them out of the garden. And he still is going to give them certain stipulations, certain things that they need to do, not just them, but the people that follow after them. How are they supposed to live for the Lord? Have you, have you ever wondered that, by the way, when you go and you read, in the, in the, especially in the Old Testament, and you read about all these people that lived before, for instance, before Abraham, as these people are that we're going to be talking about today, the people that lived before uh, Israel, before God gave them their law, spelling out so many things, and how did they live? How did they know what to do? How 
how do they know how to exercise their faith? Well, I think that God did actually give them some instructions. And some of them just aren't recorded from us. And the reason I think that is, is you see them doing certain things that God is either pleased with or God is not pleased with. And, and that would tend to make me think that they had an understanding of what they were supposed to do. And uh, we're going to look at that today. We're going to look at how uh, their relationship was different and so forth. Well, in order to start that, we're going to begin reading in Genesis chapter 3. And I want to start reading at verse 16. Now, this is where uh, God is passing out judgment after they ate of the fruit of that tree that he told them not to. Uh, he already he said some things to the serpent already, and now he's going to speak to the woman and the man. And I'm in verse 16 of Genesis chapter 3. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have, not, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the, sweat, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Now, not that the next few verses aren't important, but for the sake of our study, skip over to chapter 4, and we're going to begin at verse 7. I'm sorry, at verse 1, and read through verse 7. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time another, Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the first fruits of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you shall have rule over it. All right, let's, uh, starting with those passages, we're going to look at a couple different things. You can see I've got just a basic outline. We're going to look at the details, and then we're going to look at some of the results of that as it goes about. Well, first of all, some of the details of this particular time frame, this particular dispensation, and how God is dealing with man. First of all, who are the recipients of the, uh, of the commands that God is going to give here. First of all, it's Adam and Eve, obviously. And then it's going to be their posterity, their descendants after them. God's going to let them know how this is going to go. Although they believed God's promises and were saved, all of Adam and Eve's descendants would experience the effects of their initial sin. Born sinners with corrupted natures. Okay? Uh, theologically speaking, we would call that depravity. Now, to be depraved means uh, total depravity in our sense, and I need to explain exactly what I mean by that. Uh, total depravity means that the inherited corruption extends to every part of the unsaved person's human nature, their body, soul, spirit, that sort of thing. Now, when you hear the word total depravity, you've got to be careful on what you mean by that because you might look at someone who is the worst possible sinner, someone who just mass murdered 150 people and they tortured a bunch of others, and you say, boy, he's totally depraved. Well, it's true, he is totally depraved, but so are you. Total depravity isn't about how bad you are. It's just the fact that every part of your nature has been affected by sin. Now, we all know uh, people who don't know the Lord Jesus, and they're pretty nice people. They can be nice people. And we know other people who are rotten, mean, and you just don't want to be around. Well, they're, they're all totally depraved, even the nice people. And so even you are, even I am. Total depravity just means that there's no part of your human nature that hasn't been tainted by sin. Okay? Every part of it is. Think about it. Your thinking has been tainted by sin. Uh, your emotions have been tainted by sin. Your attitudes, your will, your body, and we could go on to all the other things about us, they've been tainted by sin. 
Uh, let me just, I'll just give an example. We were talking about this before. Remember after Adam and Eve sinned, suddenly they realized they were naked, right? Well, well why was it? They, they were naked before. What was wrong with it? Well, I'm not saying that there was anything wrong with this husband and wife being naked there before God, but suddenly now it looks bad to them. Something's not right. Well, it's because their views have been tainted by sin now. Now something doesn't seem right. Well, you get people um, nowadays that might say, uh, we need to get back to nature. We need to have nudist colonies and so forth because that's the way God created Adam and Eve in the beginning, and we need to just live that way. The problem is they're not taking into account the fact that we have all become sinners. And because we are sinners... If we were to get involved in something like that, our sin nature would roar within us. And it would cause all kinds of problems. So whenever you hear people talking about it, talking about it being all natural, they, they're missing something. They're leaving an important part of the puzzle out. Just because it's all natural doesn't make it good. Doesn't make it right. And so kind of keep that in mind. That's the idea of depravity. It affects every part of us. Uh, no, again, not that you are as bad as you can be, but you are a sinner in every part of your body. Okay, uh, it, it, you're, You will tend to sin and not obey God. That, that's what's natural for us now. So that's the idea. Well, Adam and Eve and their posterity, or their posterity after them, were born in depravity. They're all sinners. How long did it take you to realize that your young children that you just had were sinners? How long did it take you to realize that? Now, that was before. You didn't even have to teach them. Did you notice that? You know, you know, sometimes you get this little baby that is just a sweet, cute little baby, and sometimes that baby can just absolutely demand, I want my food, and I want it now. Ah! Right? Isn't that how it works? And, and they'll just scream. Now, I understand some of that is natural. They're letting you know that they're hungry. But haven't you seen your child go beyond just simply letting you know they're hungry and getting into a tantrum because of that? Well, that's just the evidence of the beginnings of it. How many of you had to teach your children to lie? Now, you might have taught them to lie if they observed you doing it. But you know what? You don't have to teach your children to lie. They, they can just naturally do that. And, and we could go on to so many other examples. How many of you had to teach your sons and your daughters to be selfish with each other? That's mine. No, that's mine. That's mine. Give it to me. You know, and they, and they battle over each other. Best story I heard of, of, of kind of illustrating how this works or, or how you can deal with this in, in one way is uh, a mom was talking about she had a piece of cake on a plate and her two sons wanted that cake. And so she was going to divide it up between them. But she thought, wait a minute, that'll be a problem. What happens when you divide it? The one that gets the piece that looks a little smaller, he's got more than me, right? So what she decided is she picked one and said, you cut the piece. And she told the other one, then you get to pick which one you want. And she said, man, that one cutting it got out a ruler and made sure there wasn't a <laughs> centimeter of difference between the two. But that just shows the idea. We're selfish. We're naturally selfish. We are totally depraved. And that, that is what became from the results of Adam and Eve and, and because of their sin. So what is the stewardship then that was put upon man? How did God expect men to live at this particular point in time. Now, there are parts of dispensations that carry on to the next. Like when Adam and Eve were told when God created them uh, that you are to uh, fill the earth, you're to have dominion over it and so forth. I believe that's still true today. And, and, and I believe that that's what we've continued doing. I think that that, that came about because of that. And, and as I mentioned last week, having dominion over the earth, I believe is what you, where you would put scientific progress and so forth. We are to use our intelligence to find things and to discover how things work and to use things for, for our benefit and so forth. And I think that that's all part of it. When you go to the dentist and the dentist uh, has to do certain work on you and they know how to do it so that you're not in excruciating pain, well, be thankful that someone had dominion over the earth and figured out how to develop painkillers and, and, anesthet and anesthetics and that sort of a thing. I, I believe that all falls into that particular category. So we still do those things, but there were certain things that God told them here that they're to do. Now, I'm not going to focus on everything because it would, it would take a long time. For instance, I'm not going to look at what he said to the woman here, although there, there are some things we could look at there. But specifically what he said to Adam. First of all, he said, you are to eke out a living from the divinely cursed ground. 
Don't you see that in chapter 3, verses 17 and 18 uh, and 19? The, the ground is cursed because you have sinned. And you're going to have to eke out a living. There's going to be difficulty. Work is going to be toilsome. By the way, work is not a result of the fall of man. God gave man work before they ever fell into sin. Work is good, and work is profitable, and work, work is, is beneficial for us. But now the difference is work is going to be toilsome. Uh, life is going to be hard. Life is going to be hazardous in different ways. He mentions uh, several things here. He mentions, for instance, when you try to grow your garden, there's thorns and thistles that are going to get in your way. This year when you do your garden and when you are exhausted from weeding your garden, you just think, this is because of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve did this. And, and that's true. That is very true. Uh, so you've got that. Uh, blight and disease is going to settle in. Uh, insects are going to become destructive, and, and you're going to have to deal with those, of course. Disease and predators will take their toll. Life is going to be difficult. That's a, that's a matter of the, of the environment being cursed. You even look in the New Testament, and Paul talks about the fact that, that even the uh, creation is waiting for the curse to be overturned because it's so difficult. Uh, for everybody, including them. And so that, that is one thing. You're going to have to eke out a living from this cursed ground. Uh, when you approach God, this is something that's not actually spoken, but it, it seems to be uh, implied. When you approach God, you must approach God by blood sacrifice. Remember when Adam and Eve, uh, right after they sinned, uh, God provided for their coverings with animal skins? I mean, animals were put to death that and apparently God must have instructed them about that because when you get to the story of Cain and Abel you see that there, there's something about that animal sacrifice when when Abel presented an animal sacrifice the first of the flock and the fat of the flock the goodness of the flock God accepted it but uh, he didn't accept uh, Cain's um, offering of the fruit and stuff so it appears that God gave them th those instructions and Cain for whatever reason, decided, no, uh, he grows sheep, he can give of that, I'm going to give what I grow of. He probably used human logic, don't people do that today? Use human logic and say, well, what's wrong with this? If, if God has, has, has done this, we should be able to, let me just give you an example of it. Here in our church, for instance, we believe that the scriptures have laid out that, that men are to have leadership within the church. And, and that uh, women would, would fall under their leadership. They could still do a lot of things, they could still lead in a lot of ways. But when it comes to the, the leadership of the pastors and the deacons, what the scriptures would point out that that, that is man, that, that he has appointed men for that. Well, I know tons of people that say, well, why is it? That just ought not to be so. Because th th if there's a woman that has the leadership skills, she should be placed in leadership there. Well, it's not about whether they've got the skills. With Cain and Abel, it's not about whether the fruit that you're offering was very good. It's not about whether you polished them up and they looked shiny and God should accept it. No, that's not what it's about. It's about what did God say? And you're supposed to do what God says. And you're supposed to approach him the way that he has shown you to be able to approach him. But instead he was using his logic. And I think that's what happens sometimes with the male leadership uh, type thing. Uh, and by the way, that's coming. That's coming. We're going to have problems with that. Because the world is really crucifying anyone anymore that, that wants to try to stick to that particular standard. Um, theologically speaking, when you believe that, that God has given men the leadership of the church, uh, and that's called, we call it complementarianism. That's what it is, where we believe that God gave wives and so forth to complement, to, to assist, to help uh, men, especially like in the family. That's why you say the husband is the, is the head of the family and his wife is his helper and so forth. Uh, yeah, uh, that's called complementarianism. It's, just, just watch over the coming years. That's going to be an issue that they're going to use to hammer churches and so forth with. Um, and, and not all churches hold that. Other churches have reasonings that would allow them to have women in leadership. Well, that's between them and the Lord. But that's, that's where we stand as far as that goes. And I think it goes right back to Cain and Abel. Cain thought what I give should be good enough. And, and what I want to offer should be what's accepted. Uh, but apparently, God had told them that you need to approach him through blood sacrifice. And we see that pattern following throughout the rest of scriptures, of course. And then, when God did approach Cain about it, the next thing he said is, you need to do well. Apparently, God had told him, you need to do well. In other words, you need to live good. You need to live right. And, and, and there's a lot of details that's not filled in here as we got this story, but apparently God did give them some instructions on how to live right. And you see here in Genesis 4, verse 7, 
God says to him, he says, uh, uh, let me begin reading at verse 6. He says, so the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And it seems to be that God is saying, if you, if you do what you're supposed to be doing, aren't you going to be accepted? Well, he wasn't accepted because apparently he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing as far as that. And he says, and if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now, I want you to notice something here. God did not blast Cain right then. God chided him, but it appears that God gave Cain the opportunity to correct this. I believe you can see grace here. You can see grace operating in this time as he's dealing with, dealing with uh, Cain and Abel. So he's still giving him that chance to change it. But, but the main point on the whole thing is that obviously God was telling people, you need to live right. You need, you need to turn from sin and, and walk right before God. And, and that was the main idea that I'm trying to get here. Well, what was man's response? during this particular time frame. And by the way, I believe this time frame goes from after Adam and Eve sinned uh, all the way up through uh, the flood when God flooded the earth and Noah had his ark. I believe that's this particular dispensation. But what was man's response? Well, most of them disobeyed. You'll see that as you read through the story. There were an awful lot of people that, uh, that disobeyed particularly Cain here, and then you follow Cain's descendants, and you start getting some real sordid details as you follow through his life, which it does list parts of his life as you keep going, the end of chapter 4. We'll talk about his family and so forth. And you'll start to see that, boy, these are people that are really starting to get involved in other types of sins, and it seems to be a downgrade is what's happening. However, some obeyed. After Adam and Eve lost Abel, they then had another son named Seth. And if you follow Seth's line, which you can do, the end of chapter 4 shows where he was born, and then you show the family going on from there, and you get, Cain, or you get Seth and his family line, you start coming across people that are walking with the Lord, people that are following God, and you start seeing that. And uh, um, this lineage goes all the way through to Noah. Uh, apparently this family passed on their faith. Of course, it, it reminds us of the whole idea that our families are important. The number one way that the church has evangelized people throughout history has been through family. Mother and father passing their faith down through the children. Yeah, don't, don't blame the pastor for not doing uh, enough evangelism. Uh, it, it's parents that evangelize their children and then grandparents that help evangelize their grandchildren. And so forth. I know most of us, our children are out of the home and so forth. But now we've got that next generation that we can deal with. We can have, we can have an impact on them. Yes, we still need to do evangelism or reaching out to others. But the primary source of evangelism has always been within the family. And you see that in this particular dispensation with the family of Adam going through their son Seth and several of those family members that are, that are following the Lord. So what is, what is God's reaction to all of this? He told men you need to live right, you need to, live, you need to do well. Uh, and and what, how does God respond? Because we already saw that the vast majority of them are going to turn away from the Lord. But there's some that are going to follow the Lord. So what does he do? Well, first of all, he judges the disobedient in this. And you get it toward the end. When you get to chapter 6 and 7, you see the flood. God brought the flood upon the earth. And we're going to look a little more at that in a minute, as specifically what was going on at the time the flood happened. But uh, God's going to destroy all flesh, except for those that he saves through the ark when the flood happened. Now, and that's what he did. He blessed the obedient. They believed his word. They did his will. And when you get right down to the end of it, you've got Noah and his family, and they're going to survive. But there are other stories during this time. For instance, uh, Abel's sacrifice was accepted by the Lord, even though he got murdered by his brother, but God accepted that. Uh, there's the name Enoch. You might remember Enoch. That's chapter 5, verse 24. It sounds like, if we are understanding this correctly, Enoch was the first person ever raptured. In fact, look at verse 24 in chapter 5. In verse 24, you have, um, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now, it could be that God just allowed him to die and, and took him home. That's a possibility. But there seems to be more to the idea that God uh, uh, raptured him, actually took him up from them. And so Enoch was one in the family line that walked with God. And then after that, you get Methuselah. Methuselah was uh, Enoch's son. 
And we all know Methuselah, right? He's the one that lived the longest. Guess what year Methuselah died? I don't have a, I don't have a number for that year. He died the year of the flood. Now, you could say that, that is if these genealogies, if all the math adds up, if they're not gaps in there, which some people would think there might be, but, but I think that they, they add up. If you add them up, Methuselah died the year of the flood. I believe Methuselah was a believer. Now, you could say he was one of the unbelievers and God killed him in the flood with everyone else. That's a possibility. But I just, I, there's enough other evidence that makes me think that he was a believer because, first of all, he was Enoch's son who was a, who was a, a believer that walked with God. We're going to see Lamech after him who was Noah's father, apparently walked with God, and, and, and you'll see uh, some of those things. I happen to, I'm going to hold to the idea that he died just before the flood happened. And then, then he went on like there. Now, you see, you see Lamech, who was Methuselah's son and Noah's dad, he died about five years before the flood took place. But uh, at any rate, there were evidences of other people within this family line that were living for the Lord. Well, in God's response, how did he use the dispensation? Or what's the, what's the results of this particular dispensation? I just want to talk about a couple things. First of all, this time frame lasted about 1,700 years. If, again, the genealogies are correct, uh, started with Adam and Eve and went through all these descendants leading up to Noah. But there's something uh, strange that happens in the meantime. And this really adds to the picture here. Uh, in chapter 6, it appears that Satan was trying to corrupt the human race. And uh, let me just give you an example. If you're in chapter 6, I'm going to look at verse 4. It says, well, let me start at verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. I think that means 120 years until the flood comes. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, they bore children to them, those who were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. And if you keep reading, the wickedness got worse. If I look at verse 5, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of men was great on the earth, and that every intent of his thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and it leads up to God causing the flood to come upon the earth. Now, why does it talk about the sons of God went into the daughters of men. There, there's two main theories here. One theory is a, little, is a little on the wild side, but you've probably heard it. The, the, the phrase sons of God is used in other places to refer to angels and, and demonic forces and so forth. And, and, and if it's being used that way here, the idea seems to be that Satan and his demonic forces somehow, some way, were able to cohabitate with the daughters of men, and he created some kind of a race. Uh, it talks about the giants that lived in the earth in that day. Some kind of a race that, uh, that grew up, but they were wicked. Okay? Now, that's one theory. I personally don't hold to that theory. Now, I know some good godly people who do, and they are Bible teachers just like the rest of us would be and so forth. To me, that's a little wild, though. I, I, what I think it's talking about is that you have Seth's line, his family line, where they're walking with God. And then you've got a bunch of the other families uh, through uh, Cain and through others that was exploding upon the earth. And they weren't walking with God at all. They were walking in sin. They weren't doing well, as God told them to. They were walking in sin. Well, I think what happened is, is, is Satan tried to tempt some of the, the believing young men in this family line to look at the non-believing daughters in this family line and then got them to come together. And throughout the scriptures, we see tons of evidence of families when you have a believer mixed with an unbeliever and it is destructive upon the faith, especially the faith of their children. It, it, it's awful. I believe that's what was happening here. I believe Satan was doing his best to destroy the, the, the line of faith that was going down through a Seth's side of the family. And what's more is I think he was very successful. I mean, extremely successful. How close did he come to wiping out faith? Well, when you get to the flood, who's left? Noah and his three sons and their wives. That's all that was left. Well, Noah's wife, if, if his wife is there, okay. But that's all that was there. Satan came that close to wiping out faith upon the face of the earth. I, I believe that that's what was going on, and that, that these believers got intermarried with them, and then it, it wrecked their faith. You know, it, it wrecked, maybe, maybe the particular 
guy that married this girl, he might have maintained his faith, but the, by his wife, and now the children that came about it, they didn't. And that family line became so wicked, so terrible, that God decided to end them all, to destroy them all. And that's why he brought the flood upon the earth. Now, that reminds me of the whole idea of what we would talk about, uh, separation. How, why, why is it that throughout the family of faith, not just in our time now of the church, but in the time of Israel, and other times God warns them about joining with unbelievers? Because they will decimate the faith. Maybe not your faith, but your children's faith afterwards. And so God warns about that. It's always been a big warning. In the church, Paul warned about it in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We won't turn there right now, but Paul was warning them. That's where he talks about being unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, what, what do we mean by separation? Now, separation has two ideas. First of all, you're separating from sin, and you're separating to God. So you're, you're turning away from sinfulness, and you want to walk with God and walk in righteousness. That's the idea of separation. Now, I believe sometimes believers throughout history have, have had an issue to where instead of just trying to separate from sin, they try to separate from everything and everybody that's not, uh, that's not how God wants it to be. And, and that brings problems. That's why, you know, sometimes Christians try to make almost like communes, if you will, where we come out and we're uh, separate from the rest of the world. We're not living with them. We do our own business. I don't think that's what it's talking about. I think we need to be in the world. We, how else do you evangelize? How else do you witness? Well, we need to be in the world, but the world shouldn't be in us. That's the idea. Is that we still are turning from the lifestyle of sinfulness that they're doing, and we're trying to follow God while we're there trying to evangelize, trying to reach out to them, uh, that kind of a thing. Well, that's the idea of separation. But Satan took advantage of that. And he almost eradicated faith from the face of the earth. Now, how did God deal with it again? He brought the flood. And uh, that was to end this particular wickedness. God also used the flood as a picture of salvation. You can even read in the New Testament where they talk about the ark as being a picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ saves us from the, 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 the uh, sin and the consequences that's going to be poured out on the world. And he carries us to God just like the ark carried uh, Noah and his family to safety until the flood waters dissipated and so forth. So God does use those things for some beautiful pictures of what he's doing. But here, here's the idea with this particular uh, dispensation. God told men once they started sinning, okay, you need to do well. You need to start living righteously. But they failed miserably, most of them. Some of them continued in faith. Even though they're sinners, like you and I are still sinners, but their, their, their life's direction was to follow God. And, and, and eventually, uh, God saved them, and through Noah and so forth, uh, from the world that was just getting worse and worse and worse, and then it started over again. And we'll get into the next dispensation next time, looking at uh, now how is God going to deal with men after this particular crisis has passed. And, and we will look at that. It uh, brings up a couple, just a couple ideas I thought would be worth us applying to ourselves through this. First of all, we need to remember how important the family is. Family is extremely important. Um, most of us are past the age where we've got children at home, but when we did have children at home, we needed to strive to pass on our faith to them. Now, you can't force your children to be believers, but you certainly can strive to point them uh, to the Lord. Well, now, most of us are beyond that, so now it would be, what about our grandchildren that are coming along? How can we help point them to the Lord Jesus. And if their parents are already pointing them to the Lord Jesus, how can we help the parents do that? How can we, how can we help uh, foster that even more? We need to be pointing their, their faces. You have a better influence on your family members than most other people could. And we need to use that influence. Uh, what about the idea of separation? You know, uh, we as conservative Christians have been known as separatists, right? As Baptists, we're known as separatists. Well, we need to be separatists in the sense that we are separating from the sin around us. And we're putting our lives toward God. Now, again, that doesn't mean leaving the world. We're still in the world. We still do business in the world. We still function in the world. We still have friends and neighbors in the world. And we need to try to have an impact on them. But we need to be careful that we're impacting them. We need to practice separation in, in that particular sense. And uh, we need to understand that we are depraved beings. That's why we need the Lord Jesus Christ. He came and settled the issue for us. 
right? And, and so he, he uh, paid the penalty for our sins, the penalty that began at Adam and Eve and is still seen being taken out on these people after that, uh, up until the flood. Uh, the Lord Jesus took our penalty for us, provided for our salvation. And uh, we need to walk with him and glorify him and allow him to do his work in the world through us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We can see your grace evidence uh, even in this, this uh, dispensation here with, with uh, you still working in Abel's life and you still allowing Cain the opportunity to change and, and for you um, maintaining a, a faithful representation on, on the earth up until even Noah's day. And we're grateful for that. And now, Father, we pray that you'd work through us. Uh, help us to maintain um, uh, a a semblance of faith. Help us to maintain the faith on the earth. Lord, we live in a time right now that feels very similar to what these people went through. It seems like the rest of the world is turning farther and farther away from you, and the rest of the world wants to do wickedness continually, and, and they don't want to submit to any of your uh, regulations, any of your uh, uh, principles that we see in our life. Lord, they don't even want to submit to the physical bodies that you've given them. They're rebelling even against that. And I pray that you would help us to, uh, to be strong and to stand as we need to stand as we represent the Lord Jesus Christ, as we represent our Heavenly Father, you, Lord. Uh, work through us. I pray in this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing one more song together, please. Turn your hymnals to hymn number 219. 219, Jesus paid it all. We'll sing the first and the last stanza. And then after the first stanza, those of you with masks who would like to leave, you are welcome to do so.